so far on Ventures in Wine Country. The spring melt has signaled the start of another growing season in British Columbia's Okanagan Valley, and our three wineries have welcomed the first buds that will eventually become their 2014 vintages. Jean, Derek, and the team at Covert Farms in Oliver have come through their first spring since making the decision to take a step back from the family farm and focus more on organic winemaking. At Painted Rock in Penticton, John Skinner has set his sights on another award-winning year as his vines continue to mature. But it's not just his wines he's hoping to put on the map. And Rob Ingram's team have been keeping focused and motivated despite weeks of delays at the Black Swift property in West Kelowna. Their sights still set on a grand vision for new brands and a new winery. Summer has officially arrived in British Columbia's wine country. The snow is a distant memory, and our three wineries have left the relative peace and tranquility of the spring behind them. Vineyards are in full bloom, visitors fill the tasting rooms and beaches alike, and the traffic never seems to stop. Some towns in the Okanagan Valley may see up to a 500% increase in residents between June and September, as visitors descend from far and wide to soak in the spectacular weather and enjoy the seemingly endless array of summertime activities. To foreign visitors, skiing might seem a more usual activity than winemaking in Canada. But in the Okanagan's desert climate, big reds are right at home, and skiing takes on a whole new look. A ski jump, is, uh, it's been fantastic. After three months of wrangling, got the insurance all figured out. My kids are coming out from all over the place. Kids from Whistler and Silver Star, Big White, a few from Alberta have come out. Reception has been really good. My daughter's doing 360s now off of it. She's getting 18, 20 feet of air off the end of this thing. Just sticking to it, it's cool. You know, the weather's been great, the water's warm. We'll be going till the end of September. Uh, my jumping's coming along. They're not pretty, but uh, I'm getting off there. The work we put into putting in a, a good bubbler system to soften up the landing has definitely kept me one piece. So uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. For sun seekers, the summer weather is just right, but this intense heat isn't always a recipe for fun. This season is already one of the warmest on record, which can mean great things for growers on the irrigated valley floor, but can spell danger for hillside communities. A fire on Mount Boucherie burns only a few blocks from the Black Swift property, a smoldering reminder that the Okanagan's heat has its drawbacks. Actually, we did have a couple little fires around here. There's one on the back side of Boucherie. I think you're best to call them the hydroplane and <laughs> drop some of their chemicals on here. Uh, it makes me feel sorry for the people that live up here, but I mean, it's got a ways to go to hit our vineyards, so. At Jason's production facility in Peachland, the flames come much closer. I saw a lot of smoke. I was actually going up there to do a tasting with some friends, the first time doing a tasting here with friends, so we're pretty excited. And I got up here and the whole hillside was burning. And my heart jumped and I turned around and went and bought sprinklers from the department store, set them up, I called up a bunch of people, friends and guys from the winery and started cutting down trees and getting things out of the way and set the sprinklers up. And it got pretty close. We stayed here in the vineyard overnight watching it uh, with a case of beer. Um, luckily, nothing happened, didn't get that close. But uh, yeah, it was pretty scary. Not that we could have done anything sitting down and drinking beer, but it felt better to be here watching it. Forest fires are almost an annual tradition in this part of Canada and usually pose little threat to populated areas. But as the weather continues to warm year after year, threats to safety become increasingly common. In these moments, the Valley's firefighters make up the last line of defense. I've been a volunteer firefighter here in Penticton for, I think, been seven years now. For the most part, the summer was pretty quiet, but we've had a, there was a few uh, grass fires. I enjoy be serving my community or, or in, and um, being part of that group, so whenever I get a chance, I try to get out there. I think the media makes a, the you know, forest fires a bigger thing that it is, because I don't know, we've been having forest fires, like interface fires for years, and 
I don't know, we deal with it every year. You know, what's, what's changed? Nothing. What's changed is that we're building houses up uh, along mountains and in, in these areas. So if we keep doing that, of course, it's going to be an issue. So is it really our, you know, it's kind of our fault in the end a bit too. Thankfully, luck is on everyone's side this year. As the danger subsides, the benefits of the hot springs start to become more clear. The Okanagan is poised for another great season in the vineyard, and with any luck, another great vintage for the rising image of Canadian wine. The Okanagan's vineyards are generally fairly quiet in July and August. Much like many of the valley's sun seekers, the fruit is content to bask in the long, hot days, steadily growing and building up its sugars. During the busy tourist season, it's the wine shops and tasting rooms that are the hubs of activity, and at Covert Farms, the fruit fields as well. Well, it's been a busy summer for us. Uh, we've had a lot, uh, a lot more tourists in the valley, which has been great at the uh, cellar door. Jean's wine shop recently bid farewell to one familiar face, but thankfully, Lou is spending another summer in the valley, looking after record numbers of visitors to the farm. Wine shop summer, this, the counter sales, we were definitely up. Having you know people like Lou and Mel, our other gal, are just fantastic because they're educated and they're passionate about what they do. We consistently get seen and shown and told that our winery experience is really good coming here because it's it's so authentic and we take a lot of time. You're not just sort of a line of people and here's the wine, here's the wine, here's the wine. You know, you come in and you spend 20 minutes, half an hour and learn all about it and can walk around and taste with your glass and there's no highway, there's no hype. The old trucks are here because they're our old trucks. They're not bought to look as part of some manufactured circus of wine. You know, I feel as a winery it's growing up and that's, you know, consistent in us, our growing as a brand. I think because we're younger and interactive and not trying to be this you know, winery on a pedestal. Um, we've been doing really well with bringing in a younger crowd, which is important. I think that that's who's gonna be the, the wine drinkers um, of tomorrow. You know, the big battle, you know, we're really good at getting in magazines, I'm really good at rocking at wine shows, and I'm really good at doing tastings and here in the farm, but I just gotta get the message out on the market more. As for Casey, luckily in the Okanagan Valley, new opportunities are never too far away. I was working at Covert Farms Family State Winery as the assistant winemaker, and now I have moved over to Noble Ridge to continue learning and, and continue to figure out how to make the best wine possible. My dream is to become a world-class winemaker, especially in, in a region that is kind of at the beginning of becoming a great region um, and is off to an amazing start. I really have to make sure that I have a game to bring to the table. Yeah, we lost Casey this year, I mean, which was a positive and a negative. You know, I'd encouraged him too as a guy that was really interested in growth to you know, get out there, do other vintages. There's only so much you'll learn in one place. It's like being a chef, you need to travel the world and see how it's done. It was too bad it happened in July. I kind of go into the season thinking that all the staff's going to be on, on board for the season. And so I was a bit surprised. You know, as a friend, 
to further his career, uh, you know, he really did need to move on and do something. So sad to see him go. Noble Ridge is friends of ours, and I actually live around the corner, so happy. But you know, hopefully he's going to go out there and conquer the world, you know, gets a little further than just down, down the road from his house and actually makes it to Australia or South Africa or somewhere where he can learn something really interesting and bring it back to our region. At Black Swift, plans and permits are still progressing at a snail's pace, and some days even the more tempered plan of a renovated tasting room seems like it's a lifetime away. But the team is keeping positive. I think November is a best case situation. Best case. It might be a spring opening, which would be, and to a certain degree, fine because it gives us time to start a marketing campaign, social media, build the website, get all our marketing materials, spec sheets. You know, as much as we can say, we realize it's a huge undertaking just to get all the little stuff around a bottle of wine set up and ready to go. Rob's return from China has given the team at least one bright spot to feed off of. It could not have been better. It's just beyond belief. R right from the start of the support with the BC government to being met at the other side by some incredibly warm, sincere Chinese people. Uh, I can't say enough about the Chinese people. They're very sincere people, very hospitable, a beautiful country, clean, and uh, shouldn't forget the part about we actually probably got three or four new distributors and we're expecting some very large orders very quickly. So it's just a great trip. Bob's recent trips abroad and conversations with John Skinner have also sparked some curiosity. And with Andrew still patiently waiting to take the helm at Black Swift, Rob has handed him a bit of homework prior to a very important meeting next week. What Rob was looking into was the standard regulatory body in BC is the VQA. And the VQA was useful 20 years ago when there was basically no BC wine industry or truth and labeling. And it was a group set up to basically ensure that wines being made in BC were made from BC wines. And it was a pretty handy thing 20 years ago when the industry was growing and kind of in flux. But in 20 years, it hasn't changed or evolved. And if anything, is now representing the people in groups that it was out to block in the first place. So that's where the politics and stuff like that comes into it. Because BC, the VQA is the BCWI. It's supposed to be an equal partnership between the three tier sized wineries, but it's the big three fund it and control it and get their way with the regulations that, of course, favor themselves and not so much the smaller and medium wineries and wine growers. As these issues continue to percolate behind the scenes, progress continues in the vineyards. It's been a fairly uh, warm summer. It's been one of the warmest summers in about 14. You know, in a year like this, you know, we, we have great fruit development right through. We're going to have fully ripe fruit and, uh, you know, good big flavors, which, uh, you know, will translate into a fantastic wine. All the varieties act differently. I mean, Cap Franc's kind of a, it's the outlier in the Okanagan. It's typically one of the earlier ripening varieties, but here, because of the extreme heat we have uh, in our summer, it actually is later because it shuts down in that extreme heat. Yeah, they all have their own little quirks of being here in the Okanagan and, you know, we just make the best wine we can with them. Now into its first full summer, John is opening Painted Rock's new tasting room up to family friends Chanel and Mike for a special occasion. A very atypical summer welcome for guests on rehearsal day has left the planners a little nervous, but the Okanagan sun doesn't usually disappear for long. We do up to 15 weddings a year. My day-to-day -day here at Painted Rock in the summertime is extremely busy. I'm working with all the brides, working with the vendors, the caterers, all the wedding planners. A lot of planning, a lot of, lot of organization. When John purchased this property, he always wanted to be able to share this property with the people. This is one of the most spectacular venues in the valley. We're really proud to be able to offer this glorious site for something other than just tasting wine. You know, it's been the first summer that we've been able to um, experience this new facility in, and, and really trial it in every circumstance. It's now the middle of July, and the hot growing conditions are adding fuel to a different fire. This is the first roundtable meeting of a fledgling coalition calling themselves Terroir BC, 
spearheaded by John, Rob, and a number of other high-profile members of the Okanagan's winemaking community. We're at an interesting crossroads, and again, I, I use this term, not a revolution, it's an evolution. We are young, we're, we're, we're a, a group of small and medium wineries that want our voices heard. Our uh, small group that's just formed, Terroir BC, which is a, a number of s small winery owners that uh, just see that it's important to market 100% grown in BC grapes to the rest of the world. Uh, uh, within the province is important, but we have organizations and associations in place such as the BC Wine Institute now, but their mandate is to promote BC wines within BC. Um, we're looking at a sort of a bigger picture and trying to get uh, access uh, uh, federal funding that's been offered to promote BC wines and uh, uh, let people know about the quality of BC wines and and make sure that people are aware that wines are coming strictly from vineyards within BC and the wines being made from grapes grown in BC and to promote that and access hopefully these funds and to market and promote uh, wines outside of uh, British Columbia. So sort of the plan for the terroir group is to be wineries that only produce 100% BC wine, like BC grape wine. It doesn't have to be VQA to lobby the government to get money to do marketing so we can get the wines out of the province and market it better within the province. In a region with more than 200 wineries of varying sizes, it can be difficult to reach a consensus on what the industry needs, let alone how to achieve it. But certain issues seem to foster more agreement than others. I think it was Jancis Robinson, a well-known master of wine from the UK, came across us in Vancouver, made a statement to the press or a magazine saying, you know, how can we call this Canadian wine when the juice isn't even in Canada, you know, isn't Canadian? Because the label will say, sell it in Canada. Well, what does that mean? It, it just means that the wine's been aged in Canada. Juice from Chile that's reconstituted and bottled in Canada. It's able to be called product of Canada because of federal rules. You know, there's some fantastic wines from all wineries of all sizes that are being made, and uh, average consumer needs to know where those wines are coming from. Because a lot of BC wines, there's a big chunk of BC wines that aren't necessarily, but uh, um, so we just want to make sure that we can let the consumer know what they're drinking. Negative angles are people think it's BC wine, and then look at, you know, our $20 bottle of wine and take, well, why would I spend 20 bucks on that BC wine when I can get, you know, $10 Jackson Triggs white label Merlot for $10? It's from BC too. Why don't they charge 10 bucks for it? And another one, Sonora Ranch, we're on the back label. It talks about the terroir of Sonora Ranch is perfect and the sun floats over the vineyards beautifully all day long. And, but it's a blend of Chile, Argentina, French, California, bulk, reconstituted juice. And there's all those people that don't care. They just want a, a, a cheap price. And, you know, that's not the point here. It's, uh, uh, there, there's always going to be people that want a $10 bottle of wine. But uh, at least let them know where it's coming from. I'll make the choice whether I want to drink this and pay 10 bucks a bottle for it and it's sold in Canada, great. Or, you know, I want to pay, you know, the 50 bucks a bottle for it. So, you know, there's obviously a financial kind of choice in there too. But people want the information, can they? You can't give them too much information. If you picked up a bottle of wine that's from a recognizable BC winery name and it said bottled and blended in BC, I think the assumption would be that that wine comes from BC. And that's where we feel that that's not really fair or truth in advertising. In different, different parts of the world, they would never ever allow that. Those people that want to support British Columbia wines are maybe buying those wines thinking they are supporting, uh, uh, you know, British Columbia farmers and, and the British Columbia grape growing um, uh, industry. And uh, so, no, I don't think there's any benefit to having labels the way they currently are. Um, I was in a liquor store just a few weeks ago and the very first front row display was uh, British Columbia, British Columbia flag, and then underneath it was uh, uh, bottled in BC and the whole rack was all wines from uh, grapes that came, or juice that came from the, uh, South America. And 
I, I just think that anybody that walked in this store, how could they not think that, that it's British Columbia product? And it's not. So there's something wrong there. Much has changed in the Okanagan since the BCWI's inception almost 25 years ago. And even many of those who aren't fully on board with Terroir BC's initiatives feel that some change is needed. Yeah, to our uh, BC, I read their newsletters and, uh, you, know, I, you know, I don't mind that someone's kind of stirring the pot a little bit. It's good. It keeps the market fresh. It keeps everybody thinking uh, on their toes. BCWI, I mean, it's, um, you know, they have a place, but uh, I don't know if, in particular if they're doing everything they could for us, you know, and maybe we do need to stir things up and shake it up a bit. They haven't taken a formal stance against CIC and they allow the big three to make huge amounts of money off CIC, which is, and some of them I think it's almost illegally labeled wines and labels. It stultifies the BC wine industry and misleads the customers. Uh, it hamstrings smaller and medium sized wineries and it allows three companies that are way too big to become even bigger and more powerful and use, you know, essentially really crappy wine to crush your competitors. We needed a, a Board of Governance review to change the board structure of the BC Wine Institute because we want a stronger voice now. There are three big guys and each has a board seat. That's 100% representation. There are 105 small guys and there were two board seats and that just doesn't make any sense. We actually asked for a review. They did a study. The study confirmed that the majority of the membership agreed that the board structure change. So it's going to be recommended, and I feel very confident that it's going to happen. Regardless of their perspectives on how it best be achieved, most of the Valley's proprietors seem to agree that elevating the status of Canadian wine on the world stage is a goal worth striving for. There's so much duality in our our wine industry of, you know, cellared in Canada versus, you know, uh, wines of BC. It's, uh, you know, it's confusing in the marketplace and I think we have to keep pushing that to uh, ensure that we have a really strong uh, wines of BC brand. You know, I'm a real champion of Canadian wine and rebranding Canadian wine away from ice wine. I've been back to Ontario recently and met with Norman Hardy. There's some great wine producers, Maury Taz, Thomas Beckhalder, and I want to try to coalesce a group of these representative wineries and start getting them on the road and re-educate the world that we're away from ice wine, because <laughs> we're not ice wine. Get our wines into London, get our wines into New York, get, get them written up by Wine Spectre and Spectator in the US and Jancis Robinson in London, and, and really let's redefine ourselves. The more markets your wine's in, the more prestigious you are. The more markets your wines are in, more people around the world know about you, which means more people come to your place. Don't take pictures of grapes in snow anymore. <laughs> take pictures of, of girls in bikinis with, with, a, with a cluster of grapes. Like, this is a really, really hot desert climate, and, and it, the world has to know that we can ripen red fruit here. It's really exciting, and then they'll understand the diversity and, and what we're able to do. It's, uh, it's very exciting. John may not have total agreement among his peers just yet, but there are other measures of success making him feel like his own dedication to quality is having the desired effect. We're very proud. Last year, we, we were the BC Winery of the Year in Intervin, and we were the number one rated BC Winery. This year, we won it all. There were 16 nations, 1,350 wines. These are tasted blind. And again, this is not chest pounding. This is context. And it's fabulous. Where are we in the grand scheme of things? And how will I know if I'm just you know, tasting it and I'm liking it and people are giving me good feedback? But when I go to London now, I'm not John from Painted Rock in the Okanagan. I'm John from Painted Rock Intervin Winery of the Year. It's a calling card. Over the last two decades, the number of wineries in the Okanagan has increased tenfold. Their varying size, soils, microclimates, and their sheer numbers can make for a wide range of opinions on just about everything. But having so many wineries in such a small geographic area is also the perfect recipe for an increasingly popular activity that the large estates in France and Italy can't match. Wine touring. I could wine tour for a solid week 
within the valley, I mean, you could wine tour within a solid week just within all over Soyuz area, so. Most of the people that we have, that we tour with, happen to be um, young ladies. So they seem to be driving the market here right now. People tend to come out and have a really great weekend and, and make a weekend out of it. There's so much to see and, uh, and do here. It's actually warmer here in the summer than what you get in Napa because we're the land of the midnight sun. We're coming closer to the north. While the Valley's winemakers are beginning to gain recognition overseas for the quality of their products, the Okanagan is also beginning to gain some serious attention abroad as one of the world's top destinations for wine lovers to visit. The Okanagan Valley uh, in the USA Today magazine for People's Choice was voted number two out of the top ten wine regions to visit in the entire world. Come to the Okanagan Valley and come to all of Rosarius where these fantastic grapes are grown, providing the entire area. Part of what makes wine touring in the Okanagan so popular is the wide range of options available, something unique for just about everyone. We came up with the kayak wine tour, and so everybody will depart here, and they'll paddle out to Three Mile Beach, which is about an hour and a half paddle. For some groups, we do a cheese and fruit platter right there on the beach, and for others, they wine tour back and get their wine and cheese tastings on the way back. We add wine to anything, and it sells, so. <laughs> It's something that we came up with from a, this Paddle to the Pub tour that I used to do, and so we just tried to make it uniquely Okanagan. Keep the focus on the wine, but also just highlight the fact that there's so much else to do here. Wine tours help make the Okanagan a great wine-related destination, but there is a growing list of festivals and activities that help make wine more than just a tourist draw or pastime. It's becoming part of the region's culture, there's a whole bunch of different events that go on throughout the year. The Winery Association starts off at the beginning of May with the Pig Out, where we get people to come in with all 31 members of our winery. And we had seven different local chefs doing a whole bunch of different food. And then all of our wineries there pairing, showing off what we can do uh, up at Covert Farms, outdoors, beautiful sunny day. Getting into the end of May, uh, we've got the Half Cork Marathon, which is getting really, really big. Uh, we had over 3,000 people register in a lottery-style system for 800 spots in the race. And we actually have our participants winding through wine country. And uh, at our water stations, there's also wine tasting along the route. So it's a fun and exciting way to get people to come out. It's uh, modeled after the Madoc Marathon in France. So uh, we encourage people to get into teams and dress up, and we have costume judging. And it's just a crazy day of fun and enjoying wine country. We've got Summer Wine Festival, get into fall where our really big signature event here that our Chamber of Commerce does a great job putting on is Festival of the Great. We had over 4,000 participants come to that event, over 50 wineries throughout the valley come and all in a big tented affair. We I think we had 16 different food trucks and over 60 different vendors, a big kids play area. I know my daughter really enjoyed you know, doing the pony rides, so it was really awesome. The next milestone for the 2014 Vintages is Verazin, when the grapes reach their full size and finally begin to show their color, and suggest a subtle hint of the flavors next year's wines will offer. Some of what we've been doing in the vineyard is preparing for uh, Verazin, which is essentially sugar start to accumulate into the grapes and the acids start to drop. The vines start off uh, being quite green. So as time goes on, it starts to lignify and it starts to become wood, which is why this looks the way it does. As time goes on, it actually forms a wood. That's a sign that Verazon is started and things start to turn purple. Uh, we're at full Verazon and we're about, I'd say three to four weeks away from harvest itself. Uh, the Pinot Noir here is pushing about 20 bricks. Pinot Blanc is just behind it, about 18, 19 bricks. So uh, we're looking at picking usually around 24 bricks. So. It's the, it's the sugar test that everyone does. Uh, I've got a refractometer. It's a little handheld digital thing. I just pour some juice on the apparatus, push start, and it tells me. It's, yeah, it's pretty much just monitoring, bird scaring, and we'll probably do one more fungicide spray with the rain we just had recently. Rain-wise, we're definitely doing much better than last year. Last September, this is the time that 
we just got poured on and the humidity came up and a lot of people were dealing with rot and that around this time, but it's fruits looking clean, canopies looking clean, so as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a great year to be a grower. <laughs> Here at Black Swift, there are finally some encouraging signs of progress away from the vines as well. It's exciting to know that things are finally getting there, but, uh, you know, I know with the city wanting us to do the million dollar upgrade, so it's, uh, it's been bumpy. <laughs> but hopefully, yeah, hopefully we're on the right track now and we've got some building going and um, I see that they've ripped down the exterior, so uh, baby steps, but hopefully by next spring it'll be up and running and yeah, we don't have to worry about all the dilemmas. Yeah, I think next year we'll um, probably downsize my garden a bit. It gets hard like when you work all day out in the vineyard and then to come in and have to go and do your garden work. Same sort of idea watching what you're taking care of produce something like wine. Which I've actually, I was just saying today that uh, I'm gonna steal some Merlot grapes and make some Merlot jelly this year, see how that turns out. Unfortunately for growers, tourists aren't the only vineyard visitors who enjoy the emerging flavors in the fruit at this time of year. A variety of animals, insects, and fungi can make short work of weeks or months of dedication, and each vineyard has its own way of protecting its crop. Well, in the organic industry, you're very limited to, uh, you know, half a dozen materials that are allowed in organic production. We maintain uh, habitat for predator insects in the vineyard, which um, helps keep the populations of leafhopper uh, at bay. You know, if you keep a nice healthy crop, um, uh, healthy plants with uh, compost and such, you just don't have as much disease pressure. Uh, we've seen that through vegetable production and it translates into the grapes as well. So, an observation a few years ago, um, people were asking, well, uh, what do you do for starlings? I noticed about, uh, about six years ago that uh, the red-tailed hawks were uh, feeding on pigeons that were eating cereal crop that we'd gone, let go to seed there. Since we noticed that, um, year after year, we just make sure we got some cereal crop or we just spread a little rye on the ground and such and make sure the pigeons are around and the red-tailed hawks prey on the pigeons and keep all the starlings away. So it, um, it's a great little symbiotic relationship that goes on and um, I guess I sort of feel a little bad for the pigeons, but uh, you know, they came before we started doing it anyway, so. Not everyone is lucky enough to have such a helping hand, which is perfect for Casey at his new home just up the highway another opportunity to learn something new. Now um, we're at the point where Verizon has, has started to happen. Um, uh, we're about halfway through. When this starts to happen, um, the berries start to taste better and better and better. And unfortunately, we're not the only ones that want to use those grapes. Um, nature quite enjoys them as well. So birds, raccoons, uh, bears, um, deer, there, there are a lot of other things that become a factor in growing grapes. So uh, we, we do put up nets um, to help with that. Scott doesn't have red-tailed hawks to depend on at the smaller suburban Black Swift property, but he's got a few other tricks up his sleeve. That's my bird scaring air cannons. Um, it's the other birds that it works well against, but the starlings are the big ones you got to watch out for. But if you've got the same sound going every three, four minutes, they'll be like, oh, that's nothing. They'll get so used to it and they'll just dive right in. You'll see them coming from miles away because they just fly in flocks. And <laughs> so when you run to the gun and get them out of here. We got two types of bangers, or screecher and are just full blown bang. Yeah, I just do it once a day. But even the cannons aren't enough to keep away the largest of visitors. So John has taken some even more extreme measures. In 2010, we lost 11 tons of fruit to bears. The gods sent us a message. They said, Painted Rock ripens fruit amazingly well. Every bear in the Okanagan came, <laughs> and it cost me a fortune. 
and for a couple of years we've had just wires going across our entrance. That's not painted rock. We want attention detail. I want there, there's just this newly developed wildlife mat that's electrical that we've installed. It's really serious. You do it once, do it right. That's always my way. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to put band-aids on things. I want to cure it. When we keep those great big wide gates open, wildlife will not come across that. So I think we've got it solved. I hope we've got that solved. Um, we'll, we'll see. The long weekend in September marks the end of the busy tourist season in the Okanagan. The valley's tourist destinations shrink as most visitors return to jobs and schools a few hours away. The weather will be warm and welcoming for many weeks yet, and with the tasting rooms hosting fewer wine seekers, there's even more room for weddings. The Okanagan has become a real hub for weddings. We see you know, probably 90% of our, our clients come from either Vancouver or from Calgary because you know, we're right in the middle. It's a bit of a destination place for couples to come. I ask every single one of my clients when they sit down in our first console, they say, why the Okanagan? Because I just want to get a feel for why this is going to be momentous to them. And every single one of them just says they really wanted a destination wedding feel. And I think like so many of my clients incorporate wine tours or they go through the orchard or they do something that really incorporates the surroundings. And your guests aren't just coming to a ceremony, they're coming to so much more than that when they come here. What the Okanagan is offering to people is having that slice of Italy, that slice of Tuscany, but right here in the Okanagan in Osoyoos. And we find a lot of the time, you know, I meet, meet couples up here when they come and want to, they want to see the venue and uh, they get here and they're pretty much sold. You know, they step out and they have a look at the surroundings and, and that's it, I mean, they're ready to book. So for the wedding that we're working with Chanel on, uh, Create a Lovely Events uh, is our planner, which is Nicole, she's fantastic. We've done a couple weddings with her so far this summer. We've got one more to go. She's great. I really enjoy working with her. She's super organized. You know, her vision is, is phenomenal. I love Painted Rock. I feel like it's the only winery really where it's completely private and you're looking out down at the Skaha Lake and you're looking down at the view and I feel like you don't need crystals and you don't need giant chandeliers. You just need the view. So many brides go to different wineries um, bef long before they're married. They're wine touring in the Okanagan and they fall in love with different places and some get engaged over a bottle of wine or at different wineries and they really connect to those places and to be able to have their wedding there I feel is really special. Weddings bring people that may not have even thought about the wine or the area until they get here and then they've discovered a new gem. Right, And then we have more weddings and then we have more tourists. <laughs> As desirable as the Okanagan and its vineyards have become for brides, grooms, and wedding planners, most wineries appreciate the added audience, publicity, and revenue stream as well. So a young couple friends of the owners who uh, decided to hold their wedding at La Stella. The fact that the business that we do day to day takes about eight years to get up and running and operational. As far as weddings are concerned, they're, they're, they're a great business for us because not only do they expose us to a whole set of people who may never have been to the Okanagan before, who may never have seen our product or tasted our wine before, uh, so that, that, that puts us on their, on, their, on their radar, on their friends' radar. So it's great, it's great exposure. Uh, this is something that we can, that we can kind of count on. And um, it's so, so it is complimentary in the end, but very, very different. Much like Painted Rock, the sprawling Covert Farms property offers a tranquil, private setting, perfectly suited for a destination gathering. But Jean's not rushing into any wedding plans just yet. I got married once and it was a lot of work and, you know, there's so many details and, you know, everybody gets really up, you know, uptight about it and wants to make sure that it's perfect and so uh, it's something you want to have the right people in, at the, you know, for that. Before we jump into that and, you know, cause more problems than uh, benefits, we've got to make sure we're going to do it right. You know, if we're going to do it, I want the experience to be great for the people who come here, and uh, I don't want it to be a total headache for us either. Although the team at Covert isn't quite ready to host weddings this summer, they're no strangers to big events. And with harvest time approaching, there's just enough time for one last great summer party. We started The Frequent Farmer three years ago uh, with uh, Lindy Hill from Hoodoo Adventures. The farm has 50 years of heritage of all kinds of jobs and uh, equipment and such that we can put to it. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. 
it's uh, a 5K and a 14K uh, circuit there for the adults. And then we got a couple short races for the kids, uh, one, three, and 5K races. Coming up on Ventures in Wine Country. Terroir BC continues to make waves and expand its membership. Black Swift's tasting room finally begins to take shape. And Gene partners up with a familiar face for an exciting new endeavor, just in time for harvest. I was only going to get into this business if I found a property worthy of a 10 out of 10 mandate. So I looked for three or four years to find this. I looked at a lot of wineries that were for sale, and it wasn't until we found this. It was long known as, for many, many years, it had been the largest apricot orchard in the British Commonwealth, known as the Black Hawk. The orchard had been felled 17 years previously. Uh, at the time of the gyp gypsy moth infestation. And I spent a lot of time looking and learning and doing my due diligence. And it rated class one in virtually every aspect, air movement and heat units and, and everything. It was a pretty spectacular opportunity. So before I made the deal to buy the property, I had to come up here and stand on the dirt and, and walk around and get a, get a sense for it. Well, that was January 2004. And when I came up here, I stood at the top of the property and looked out over it and it was just glorious, but it was also in about uh, probably nine inches of snow. So I, I just looked out and, and I knew the soil type and I knew the, the reports on it were, were good. Um, so I went back and I made the deal and I bought the property and I came back two weeks later with my daughter and uh, we stood at the top of the property and I looked out and the snow was gone and there was just a sea of small stumps and they were about six inches. There had been nine inches of snow on the property and I, I didn't know. Uh, I knew they'd taken it down but it didn't even occur to me. It was just one of these, one of these, I mean that's, that's farming, that's, that's just, well that was, that was kind of uh, uh, funny but in essence it was a good thing for us because it made us dial back any intention of planting in that year so we got to do a tremendous amount of due diligence on the site so we had 48 cats out here for the better part of a year uh, very very meticulously peeling back topsoil repairing the topography taking out the stumps putting it back and we knew we wanted to farm this for generations so we wanted to do it once and do it right and I uh, wouldn't change a thing. This is uh, really, the, this dirt has proved itself to me now and it's worthy of every ounce of effort that we have put into it and we are putting into it and, and we're getting better.